All right, uh, good morning, gents. Um, happy to be here uh, 402 days and, um, and be able to actually share a little bit of my story with you and my journey to this point. Um, I hope that each one of you can take something away that helps you uh, in your own journey of recovery, renewal, or repair of relationships with family, with God, or with your friends, uh, whoever has been affected by, uh, by your behavior and actions. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Britt Regis. Um, I was born and raised in the land of the free and the home of the brave deep in the heart of Texas. And um, like many of you here, uh, my past is peppered with trauma and pain and disappointment and disillusionment. There's a theme of broken things that surrounded my formative years and uh, including a broken family, broken promises, broken trust, broken faith. To give you a sample of uh, the situations that shaped my early years, I was very involved with the church uh, from an early age. My mom took me three days a week to church events. Uh, anytime it was open, uh, we were there. Uh, and I was baptized by a man, our pastor, uh, that my mother was having an affair with. Mm. And uh, see, I uncovered and exposed their secret relationship to the church who ultimately ostracized me personally for my mother's behavior uh, because I was the one to expose it. There were factions in the church and the elders who were trying to protect the pastor uh, rather than hold him accountable for his part in the affair. And ultimately the corruption of my church, it was imbued with toxic religiosity at home and what I believe was mental illness, uh, narcissism, psychosis, uh, by several characters, including my mother, which led to the breakup of my family. The story goes on, and it's worth a Jerry Springer episode for sure, maybe even a 60 Minutes docu-series, but I'll leave it there for now, as that gives you a fair characterization of what the people in my life were capable of. And as you can imagine, I turned into self-soothing behavior, mm -hmm. which led to selfish behavior via the PMO cycle. It was my drug, my drug of choice, and my brain started to get hardwired to crave the chemical cocktail of porn on demand. Um, while the frequency or dependency fluctuated over the years, it was always there. Mm. I rationalized it as a victimless crime or harmless act that was taboo, but also normal or mainstream. I had no clue the damage that it can and would cause. So I went on to graduate university and got married to a beautiful young bride. And we set down roots here in I was from BC. And as you may surmise, the porn followed me. Earlier in our marriage, it came out and I told my wife I'd put it behind me, but eventually I turned back to it as a drug of choice again. So I struggled with old scars from past traumas, you know, uh, the new stresses of providing for a new family, adjusted to the ups and downs of married life, even had a first child with medical issues early on. And it went on for years under the radar in isolation and darkness. And uh, one, one night my wife confronted me and she asked me if I, if I was still looking at pornography. And I was honest, but it was much too late. The damage was done and the victims of my victimless crime were all of a sudden very real. So I had been concealing the, the uh, behavior for years and, and I, I did know it was wrong. But like I said, I lied to myself and rationalized it for so long. It was my MO at that point. So coming clean uh, led me to uh, Dr. Dave and then to regroup. Uh, and since November 14, 2020, I've been committed to my recovery journey, making today uh, all clear 402. And that's a summary of my past and how I got here. Now, I really want to share a bit about what I learned that's helped me achieve victory so far. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that the PMO cycle is completely self-serving behavior. Self-soothing, self-serving, -ser self-help. It's all selfish. And the key word there is self. 
Um, PMO limits the emotional and physical availability for your spouse and your kids. Oh, yes. It makes you oblivious to your wife's needs and limits capacity for emotional connectivity because you're spending that energy hiding and protecting your selfish behaviors. More energy goes into it than you think. It perverts or defiles the true gift of marital sex and how it should be experienced. Um, and like I said, watching pornography, it's not a victimless crime. Now putting aside the actual harm and trauma inside the industry itself and the very real clinical, psychological and societal issues, even the secular world is beginning to acknowledge. Pornography puts an emotional and physical wedge between you and your spouse. And when you're in it, it's hard to recognize because you're clouded by lies and rationalizing and hiding it. And when you've stripped it out of your life, it becomes very clear that there was a mental and physical barrier pushing apart your private life from your married life. And you realize how much energy it, was, it, it took to keep the two separated. And that energy is pulled away or stolen from other places in your life. Places that matter most, like your spouse, your family, your work, and your faith. So a reconditioning of your mind and body is mission critical to have the best shot at real recovery. Now, the addict's mind is conditioned to crave the stimuli, sex, drugs, sugar, alcohol, pick your poison. There's a real physical and chemical component to addictive behavior, and there are real withdrawal symptoms that when the stimulus is denied or withheld, and the struggle against those withdrawal symptoms is very real and very taxing physically and emotionally. And so I've learned that strength through religious means is very effective and healthy for the mind and the soul, which is why it's such a cornerstone in regroup in the 12 steps. Um, I've also learned that regroup uh, serves to ensure connectedness, camaraderie, support, and accountability during the very challenging seasons of a person's recovery. Now, human beings weren't created to take on big things in isolation. Cavemen didn't hunt woolly mammoths one-on-one. -on -one. Scientists, one scientist didn't send a man to the moon. It took a team of support groups. So to truly succeed, you must be humble. You must try to every day to die to yourself. And that part is the hardest part to do. I believe it's a lifetime objective requiring uh, reminders and refreshers daily. All the, all the steps in the 12 step program help you understand your past uh, to get a healthier future. But for me, the biggest key was to find and focus on my motivators for change in mind with my kids. Having my kids in focus, it helped me get my wife in focus. And now my family's in full focus and I'm so motivated to not let them take the sideline in my mind again. And like they were saying, it's my legacy to them and their future husbands and my future grandkids and so on and so forth. That motivates me to live honorably and seek humility and be what they deserve me to be. And like Dave says, uh, boys make excuses and men make changes. And this is represented in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. So when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I put selfish ways behind me. And the hard truth, this is a hard truth that helped me man up, own what I've done, own the damage, own my defect, so I can stop rationalizing and stop lying and stop hiding. Before you can give it to God, you must hold the actual weight of it first, fully acknowledge that it's there, and then fully turn it over. And I can tell you, this is painful and uncomfortable. And it feels like you're being disciplined, and you are. And it results in discipline. So this verse speaks directly to discipline, and I think we all need to hear it. Hebrews 12, 4 to 12. Uh, in your struggle against sin, 
you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you completely forgotten the words of encouragement that address you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what, for what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. So I love that verse because it is hard. But God loves us. And he's doing this for us like a, like a dad would do to his kids. And it will create resilience and character. But to accept discipline and practice discipline, you must be humble. And the three principles of Christianity, I think last week mentioned by Colin, humility, humility, humility. And Merriam-Webster simply defines humility as freedom from pride or arrogance, the quality of or state of being humble. So let's look at the three senses in which it's defined. One, not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive. Two, uh, reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of deference or submission. Three, ranking low in a hierarchy or scale. Now, the importance of humility is directly related to the deadly consequence of pride. Pride separates us from God as we do not acknowledge and appreciate the magnitude of his eternal sovereignty. Therefore, the importance of humility is seen in the deep gratitude we hold and proper recognition of God's divinity and his love for us. Humility's importance is, so, uh, is also found in recognizing our flawed nature as humans on earth and our susceptibility to sin if we're not vigilant against temptation. And so that's why we're all here this morning. And I appreciate you guys for being that for me on this group to 402, or on this journey to 402. And a couple last bullet points I had to, I had to throw in at the end of this thing, because uh, they're very important. And, and I went through my journal to, to go pick out the best uh, takeaways, but a hardened heart has no patience. And my heart has been hardened for so long. And my patience asked my kids very little, <laughs> especially with my wife. So have a humble heart mm. and aloneness, hiding and darkness is where sin and addiction live. So stay in the light with your actions and your behaviors. Mm. And each day is a new day to build your legacy. So don't waste it. Mm. And lastly, your legacy will be a rock of remembrance or a rock of stumbling for future generations. So it's your choice. So thanks for being wingmen for me on my journey. And I appreciate the humility demonstrated in this group and the discipline shown by the regular attendees each week. So keep it up. It works. That's it.